Hello, welcome to another live Google Hangout on the Living Income Guaranteed. And today we are going to be continuing our discussions in the past Hangouts on cryptocurrencies, alternative currencies, and really going into or behind the veil of money and getting to see alternatives from the mainstream economy. And now it's the turn of getting behind the veil of the turbulent world of finance. Uh, with Robinhood Cooperative, um, Hacking Finance for the Common Good is the title of this hangout. Um, they are a, an activist hedge fund cooperative that has determined that there is a way to democratize finance and to create banking for the precariat. And they have this vision of a world where more people can be benefited from a world that is currently only benefiting the elite. And that is by funding projects and by distributing money back to the common good. So to discuss this, uh, we have invited Terre Baden from Finland, right now in Milan, CEO of Robin Hood. So welcome Terre to the Hangout. Nice to have you. you here. Glad to be here. Okay, so to remind you, the viewer, uh, we have questions and comments that you can place throughout the Hangout. And um, please make sure that you place them throughout the 40 minutes that we plan to be discussing. Um, also, if you're watching the repetition on YouTube, don't worry, you can place the comments, questions there for Tere in the comment section of the YouTube video, and we will let him know as well. So without further ado, let's get into the discussion. And we got the first question, even before the Hangout, which is from uh, Jani, and it's precisely the first question that we have for you. Let's start with sharing the basics of uh, what the Robin Hood Cooperative is and what what motivated you guys to create it in 2012 yeah so uh well basically sort of formally the robin hood co-op as it exists now is a co-op uh, established in in finland in in 2012 uh, by a group of uh, artists activists and uh, of uh, economists and political thinkers and philosophers and so on who were thinking about the uh, financialization of economy? As that's one of the one of one of the big backgrounds. And then the other thing is this: uh, what is happening to labor and what is happening to labor relationships, the precarization of of labor and uh, and uh, also growing peer to peer relationships and peer production and and so on. So. Those were the background ideas why why people wanted to wanted to do this. And can you give us a one-on-one -on -one walk on how Robin Hood operates? Yes, it's it's basically uh, because well, basically it's a hedge fund, but but there are three things that separate it from a from an ordinary hedge fund. The first thing is of course that it is a cooperative. So, and, and like any cooperative, it means that one member, one vote. Members own the cooperative and cooperative. It's, it's, uh, it's run in, in that way. And also maybe, maybe connected to that is that uh, uh, 60 euros is the minimum amount you have to have in order to become a, become a full, full, fully, uh, fully incorporated member of the co-op. So it, typically in a hedge fund, you have to have thousands or tens of thousands. So that's also, also part of the co-op structure. Then the second strange thing is that uh, uh, part of the profits, it, it's in the rules of the co-op, that part of the profits generated go into, into, common, into projects that build the commons. And uh, that's, that's sort of, uh, that's agreed. And then the members can sort of, uh, decide how much of their uh, when they buy shares they can choose that it's a 50 50 split for instance that 50 percent goes to themselves and 50 goes to the projects or it can be a 20 80 or 30 70 split or something like that a different split but in any case some some money goes to the commons building projects and then then the third uh, strange thing is that uh, uh, the investment is done by an algorithm, by a data mining algorithm that follows the uh, data feed of the New York Stock Exchange and analyzes that and on the basis of that gives recommend recommendations and make, makes the decisions on, on where, to, where to invest. So, so basically we are a co-op, 
and the members uh, become, uh, they, they pay a membership fee to become members and then they buy shares in this, this uh, common pool of assets that we have. And that common pool is then placed on, on the New York Stock Exchange. So one of the principles that you have is that you're disrupting the current flows of money and which is going, as I was saying, to the elitist world for the most part. And as you were mentioning, investing on these commons. So how does this practically take place? Uh, well, it's, it's well, yeah, the money, uh, oh, oh, sorry, the name, name obligates that. It's the same that Robin Hood uh, used to do also previously to observe the circulation and the flows of money in the forest and then go go there and pick some for 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 our own purposes now how it happens is that uh, the uh, parasite it follows uh, competent it follows basically all the uh, players not not exactly all but but most of the players on the stock exchange and 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 uh, discovers which of the players is good with which stock there might be some pairings that this, uh, this trader is always making money on this stock and then there is somebody else who is also making typically money on that stock and so on. And when it finds a cluster of these people that are good on some stock and it sees that there's a consensus forming, all of them are try, try starting to sell or all of them are starting to uh, buy, then the parasite follows. So it, it, it sort of uh, maps the competence of the buyers, not any individual buyers, but the consensus among uh, competent buyers. And uh, they, 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 from there we hope that, that we get uh, profits for, for these uh, shares that we have. And then uh, when, we, when we have enough, like now after two years of operation, we decided that we can safely take 15,000 out from there. So we sold some shares and, and took out 50,000 euros and then the decision making happens so that uh, uh, the members, any member can suggest the project to be funded. There are very, very sort of, uh, very strict, but very simple rules. The, the, basically the only rule is that the project has to be uh, somehow building the commons. It has to be bigger than itself. So it's not only for some specific group of people, but something that gives to everybody to the commons. Some, it can be something that produces goods or knowledge or space or whatever. So members can propose the projects and, and we got uh, 49 uh, proposals this, this first round now this year. And then uh, members can also volunteer to become members in the committee that decides which project will be funded. So there were some volunteers and then just by lottery we chose three people to become the committee, the project committee, that UNAN then has to be sort of, has to make a consensus decision on which project or projects. They also had free hands, whether they want to give it to one project or several projects or whatever. And they ended up uh, in, in wanting to finance three projects. And so that's, that's what happened. So in essence, the members of your, co your the cooperative are regular people as you mentioned artists and activists and hacktivists um so this is not um the usual idea that we get of a hedge fund being uh presided and you know having members that we don't even get to know the names of and are these people that generally are only there to make money for themselves but we are talking about regular kind of people is this correct yes absolutely we have made some some uh, surveys of our membership and of course we also initially now we are 700 seven, 700 members so we don't anymore know everybody everybody individually but in the beginning sort of it was obvious that the people who are interested in this are uh, typically people who already are involved in some way in in in, in a kind of project economy so they, they often are artists self-employed people also technically or techy kind of nerd kind of people who, who work in projects that, that last for some months and they, they get their financing from different sources and, and, and self-manage self -manage that all the time. So they understand the, the fact that the uh, labor market and the, and the sort of uh, the whole situation has changed so that it is not any more 
uh, meaningful to try to get this kind of uh, <clears throat> old world of uh, stable wage labor relationships. So it's often young young people. The the middle age of our members is, is relatively low, young people and and uh, creative people and so on. Maybe that's also because uh, Robin Hood started as an as a sort of under the guise or as as an artistic project, and we still also do it a little bit in keeping in mind this this aspect that it is an artistic project. In, of, of course, we, we we are serious and we do it with real. We, we play with real money. It's not a not a not a artistic project or imaginary project in in that sense. But but it's, it is artistic in the sense that we experiment and and we are not only interested in the in the money or, or the bottom line, but also how this makes people feel. What is the experiential relationship that people get to money? Or to finance by by being involved in Robin Hood. So in that sense, it is also an artistic project. We try to uh, uh, how, how to put it. We try to change people's sensibilities and expectations and affects that have to do have to do with with uh, with money and, and finances. This might be also a, a point that um, many people might think or bring up whenever they hear about your project and, uh, you know, realizing that finance is a great cause of problems and abuse in this world and massive speculation. So how do you usually approach um, this perspective that is coming from a general concern of how we're seeing that we are essentially being uh, all affected by the deregulation of financial and so you take part of it in, in a way as well so um, of course with a twist so how do you approach this kind of concern now well there are two two basic uh, basic ways for for me personally the the crucial thing was i was also when when i first heard about robin hood i was very intrigued and 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 uh, uh, sort of interested but but then uh, coming from a sort of general critical leftist background i was also sort of had this this uh, aversion to to anything that has to do with the stock exchange and so on but then what what sort of changed my mind was this realization that there are no financial virgins that if if we, if you use money if if you uh, have money in a bank account if you if you have money in a pension fund if you have money in some other fund, if you, actually even if you just go to the shop, if you go to the shop of a big uh, sort of multinational uh, chain store, or if you buy anything from a big company, the money doesn't go to the safe of the shopkeeper. The money is already sort of accounted for in the in the expectations for for that company and so on, and it just uh, sort of disappears right away it disappears or even before you pay for for the for the uh for the product it, it is already uh, uh being played with in the derivatives market and in the financial financial market so in that sense the if if one one wants to be completely clear of financial uh, the financial sector and financial markets then the other option is to go without money completely without Euro or dollar or any of these big money systems, and that is a possibility. And and I have some friends who who do that, and I I respect them very much. That's that's a very good very good sort of idea, I think. So, but as long as we we use money, then we are implicated in the financial sector. So then the question is just how we are implicated, and then that comes to the second part of the second part of the answer. That we think that it is possible, like 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 maybe it was Warren Buffett that said this that these derivatives and so on they are weapons of mass destruction, but but we, we believe that they can also be weapons of of mass construction if they are used in a, in an intelligent and, and smart way. Because of course they are just uh, uh, what we are dealing with here is is rules and and. Uh, what, what do you call it in English? The rules and, and agreements between people, and they can always be changed. And, and what is so good about these financial instruments is that they are fungible. You can you can change them. You can you can sort of put them to any shape and form that you want to. 
the only only problem is now that this this possibility is given to people who have a lot of money and uh, it would be nice if that possibility is also given to people who don't have so much so much money so this is in a way continuing that discussion on money not being the actual root of all evil it is the way that we use it and how we decide to repurpose it or redefine it or back it in a different way that would make the difference and with this um we generally also say that it is up to us eventually what kind of agreements we create and also that applies to the financial world as well uh, so we have a, some questions so let's get through them uh, we have first from Jason Johannes and he's saying you write in your website that you imitate the choices of best market actors so if I invest money to Robin Hood I cannot affect whether my money is used to buy stocks from weapon industry or clean tech industry for instance Yes, that, that is correct. That is correct. So we don't do ethical investment. We just do basic plain money line investment. So it can go it can go to any stock that is exists in the in the market. That is that is true. And that comes sort of ties to the previous point in, in the sense that we are we are not trying to do something ethical here. We are not trying to be good. It, it also ties to the, to the uh, topic of the ephemera conference that in, in which I was today here in, in Milan. They were talking about the, uh, well, the, the, the title was Subversion of Unhappiness. And there's a, a very general feeling here in the Italian uh, crowd, but also more generally in the Mediterranean crowd, you know, from, from Greece to Spain and Italy and so on, that uh, especially with the, with the experiences of the Syriza government are now in, in Greece, that even if you get parliamentary governmental power, you can't change anything, which, which sort of uh, adds to this kind of mood of uh, unhappiness and, and, and anxiety and so on, as the mood in, in which people exist in, in, in capitalism. And in our analysis, part of that, uh, part of that problem, part of this affective problem, is precisely that we try to be so communal and so good, and and that is very exhausting labor, very very sort of, uh, 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 very it's very taxing and very exhausting. The cool thing about money, the classical cool thing also that Marx and so on also know, note about is that money gives you the possibility to uh, disappear, to leave, uh, to leave uh, communities or, or groups or places where you live if they, are, if they are not good for you. That is the cool thing about money. It also take, uh, breaks these, these patriarchal and, and, and traditional ties and gives you freedom. So there is emancipatory power in money also. Okay, and we go to his second question. Are there similar initiatives from other countries as well? How international group do your members come from? Or are uh, your members from? Not, not exactly similar, but, but uh, or not exactly the same, but there are some, some similar things, of course, because one, one thing you can, uh, or one way you can look at Robin Hood also is, is this kind of, uh, uh, the general trend that exists now that uh, we try to cut out the middleman and, and deal directly or people to deal directly with, uh, with peer relationship and so on. So in that sense there are other, other uh, uh, companies and other, other, other uh, projects that do the same that they cut the middleman between, cut the middleman away from between people and the stock exchange. So there are projects like that. And our, our membership is actually very, very international. The team that, uh, that we work to, or the volunteers that keep up the Robin Hood and the website and so on, they are from United States and Brazil and UK and Italy and Finland. And, and our members are, are all over the world, really, from, from pretty much every, every uh, from almost every country. Okay, we have another one from Temu Leonin, um, and okay. he's saying how the how the Robin Hood Corp is able to invest on Commons projects when it is at least at this point um, losing money when it is 
losing money or how does that work? Yeah, yeah we are right now losing money because in, uh, uh, after the Chinese scare, or how, how it is called, in, now in September, the stock exchange is, is going down and we are losing money. So if that happens, then we can't. We can't invest. We have to be. We have to be. Have to have a profit. Have to be on the plus side in order to be that. So in that sense, of course, we are tied to the stock exchange. That if if we start losing money, then we can't do it. And that's one one thing that we, of course, realize that that is a problem. And that is why we want, we want to diversify. Robin Hood, financial techniques. Uh, available for our members and, and for everybody, for new members also, so that we wouldn't be uh, dependent on this one algorithm, this parasite algorithm only. That is also part of, um, you know, the questions that I had. Uh, thanks, Demo, for the question. Uh, also, Jason is uh, thanking for the answers. So in relation to this uh, point of playing the same way that the financial elite does, kind of like using the same parasitism that they do with your algorithm called the parasite, as I understood, doing the same. And within a system that, as we know, it is a financial bubble and it might burst, as all bubbles do. So yes. you were mentioning these future endeavors, projects of how Robinhood can then <laughs> Continue existing. Yeah. So, so uh, during these two two years, we have learned a lot, and uh, one thing that we have learned is, is this that this this kind of this is okay, and and we were very happy now to be able to to have this first batch batch of projects supported. But we have also learned that this traditional co-op is not a very good structure for doing this. Because, well, it's very bureaucratic and there are all kinds of rules and regulations that stop us from doing what we would like to do. So we started thinking that what, uh, what would a co-op be like? What would a co-op be if it was invented now, in the, in the 21st century? What would be a co-op like? And, and uh, we think that it would be, uh, uh, although this is our wager, this is our guess, that it would be a platform a platform like Airbnb or Uber or something like that, that makes it possible for people to take unused, unused, uh, let's say, means of production or, or in our case, actually unused capital uh, and, and money and put it to work. The difference, the important difference being that, of course, Airbnb and Uber and so on, the platform is owned by, by a company. And in that sense, what, what people get from Airbnb and, and Uber is actually a, a further marketization of their, of their living room or, or, or their house. They have to think about, uh, if, I, if I sleep in my bed tonight, then I'm not get, getting the money for it, so should I go outside and, and rent my... So it's a further marketization. But, but uh, if the platform was also owned by the members, that would be that would be the claims that would make it a, a true cooperative and from this we come to these ideas that we have had uh, on on something like uh, basic income or common fare or cooperative fare or something like that that if this platform is is owned by the members and it it uh, facilitates successful financial exchanges between people and and this platform for for uh, for many reasons, these platforms platform should be on the blockchain so that people can uh, directly engage with each other via relationship without any central organ or certain central organization that has to make decisions. Because this is so cumbersome with the, with the traditional co-op. We have to have general meetings and invite all the people and it's, it's, uh, it's quite sticky business. And we, we don't necessarily need that because people could do it directly uh, between each other in groups or as individuals or whatever they want to be. So it should be on the blockchain. And if it is on the blockchain, we could devise it so that every time there is a, a, a successful financial transaction between people, a new coin is minted. And that coin gets distributed between those people who were engaged in this successful financial transaction. And part of it 
would go to the to the common part of it would be common to the to the pool of all members and so on so this could form something like a common fair something like that so that whenever something successful happens on the platform everybody benefits from it so is this like also going into the basics of peer-to-peer -peer finance and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platforms to create like the new peer-to-peer -peer banking as well? Um, would this be the real sharing economy as you would define it? Or what's your take on this? That's sort of, a, yeah. Yeah, we think that there are a lot of, lot of people and a lot of networks and projects that, that are working now in this way. But what they are lacking is the financial tool to make it easy to, and to, to facilitate it and, and to make it, make it sort of for, like what is, what is so good about Airbnb and Facebook and these, these uh, platforms is that they make, they, they make things easy. So it, it, I, I, somebody who doesn't understand anything, anything about the hotel business or taxi business or whatever, they can do it with the, with the help of the application and so on. So that is our plan to to make make this platform and as Robin Hood to uh, offer applications on that that platform that make the use of these financial tools like derivatives options and so on as easy as it is to use Airbnb or Uber or something like that so that the application facilitates and takes care of the hard technical stuff and then you just in a in a way that is uh, that is almost like a social network that at the same time same time uh, financial relationships okay in terms of um if we look at it directly um going back to how currently Robinhood is operating and how it's working uh, where does the money really come from because many people don't have a precise idea of how financial system operates and in this you were mentioning before that of course your point is not to be ethical but then um as we know when someone wins someone loses out so can you give us a little uh, background on that well, uh, we actually have a lot of a lot of sort of thinking and, and thought and, and texts and writing about this in, in, in the in the background and we have thought about this this a lot. This is the starting point for what what we're starting doing. But uh, to put it in a in a nutshell, the thing is of course that uh, the uh, GD the combined GDPs, if we take the combined GDPs of all the countries in the world then the financial markets are at least 40, 50, 60 times bigger than the combined GDPs of, 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 the all, of all the countries put together. And it's basically uh, eight or nine banks that control all of, this, all of these derivatives markets. And uh, in that sense, uh, profits, uh, big profits are made there. And that's part of also the economic situation right now that companies actually don't find uh, they are not so much interested in, in, in investing in production because they, they don't get the, the kind of profit margins that they get from finance. And it's also for people, people, smart people, they go to finance if they can, because they get much better, uh, much better rewards from there. So the profits are made there. So the valorization. As, as it is called in, in economic theory, the valorization of our labor is not done in, or, or it, it's all also the more done in the financial economy. That's that's where the valorization happens, and that's where the where the profits are made. So in that sense, uh, I would say that uh, uh, some of the, of course, these these derivatives they are like comp co competing claims on what actually is in the world but because it is so much bigger it's tens of times bigger than the real economy if, if people if, if people here in the derivative economy in the financial economy if they decide that okay we don't trust the Greeks we don't trust that they are going to pay back, pay back their loans they have such a big lever that they can break anything in the in the real economy and, and that is that is the power of the financial economy, and that is where the real profits are, are made these days. 
So if we want to be a part of that, if we, even if we even if we don't want to be a part of that, but even if we just want to learn how that functions, we have to learn by doing, and we have to sort of operate there, and and see that world also because it is something that uh, decides what happens in the world, in our world, in our actual world, and it would be very very uh, counterproductive to shut out our eyes from it. One thing that I've of, of course curious about is whether basic income is part of your plans within the cooperative. Has it been part of the discussions? What's your take on it? Yes, it has been very much a, a part of the uh, motivation for, for many people who, who take part in, in Robin Hood. Uh, because there are well, one one uh, uh, one uh, uh, way of thinking about basic income is is to think that it is, it is the state that, that that can provide it. But of course, then there are reasons also for for disliking that. Even if even if there would be a state that would do it, there might be problems with, with it. For instance, in 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 the Finnish context, from from where I come, the the idea has been that okay, if we can do basic income if there is also involved uh, uh, sort of some sort of reciprocity that people have to work for it uh, for in, in some sort of uh, some uh, common purpose works which which sort of as such doesn't sound so bad but actually could could uh, uh, devolve into something like slave labor pretty quickly in, in in the current circumstances so people have been thinking about basic income also what how could it be provided by something, some non-state actor? And of course, their cooperatives and, and, and these kind of mutual, mutual uh, organizations are a good possibility. And now, especially with the new financial technologies, that should be possible. So the way that I was, I was talking about before, that if, if we have a financial Form that is owned by by its men, then we can make the benefits of of uh, successful uh, successful circulation on the platform accrue to to everyone. There are many many different possible ways of, of doing that. And actually, today in in the conference, there were there were there was a group from uh, Rome in in Italy who had a very very nice and very refined way of of thinking about this how how it could be done. There is the, there is the idea by Dimitri, Dimitri Kleiner and, and uh, others, the so-called telecommunist, then they call it, it venture communism and so on, where where after after a sort of a, it could be done so that uh, the platform finances the purchase of of means of production, and then those means of production end up owned by the people by the group who who have worked and, and supported it in, in terms of something like equity crowdfunding or something like that so that would create commons and that would also create basic income again from the means of the commonly owned means of production so there are several possible ways of, of, of doing this I like the idea that you've presented as future plans also for Robin Hood to uh, go back a little bit to that real economy from peer to peer and um, also being part of this uh, promotion of that awareness that, hey, we can get organized and get this done, not necessarily waiting for a government to manage to get the funds and place their own um, rules to provide this. Because as I understand in Finland, there's also the welfare system that already um, requires certain kind of work for to get these kind of benefits. So it wouldn't be that different from that perspective on what we've been hearing of Finland um, going to implement a basic income pilot program or just a program there. Um, so in, in that regard, you were, you know, you are in Milan and you have discussed about um, in income and alternative currencies, something like that. So can you share a little bit on what you shared? The, the connection was was breaking there a little bit, but but I think you asked about the discussions here in, in Milan. So there were. Yes. I think it is it is uh, safe to say right now that uh, there are a lot of, lot of projects uh, thinking about alternative currencies and cryptocurrencies and and local currencies and and so on. 
part of that is is something like uh, uh, like uh, Pifo Berardi calls it something something like uh, lifeboat communism, like like in Greece that when the state season doesn't uh, doesn't do its uh, doesn't do its job anymore, then of course people are forced to do it themselves and and forced to using local currencies and and so on. But part of it is it is sort of like uh, self initiated also in order to uh, create monetary arrangements that are more beneficial to to different groups than the than the straight jacket. Of course, sort of that that's also part of especially. Especially in Europe, that is that is a big part of the feeling that the euro is be, is becoming a straitjacket, and the and the rules have been defined so that that uh, uh, the game is so rigged that it, it can't be, it, it is impossible to to uh, in, envision how it could help the help the common common people and so on. So so uh, in that sense, uh, one way I, I I like to think think. Of in this way that also these technological tools and, and social tools, social ways of organizing have become more powerful. So, so one, one analogy that Vinay Gupta uses is that cryptography, cryptographic algorithms used to be labeled weapons in the 90s. Cryptographic algorithms, the United States forbade the export of cryptographic algorithms. You couldn't you, could, you couldn't export algorithms, certain algorithms, because they were labeled as, as weapons, as weapons grade uh, uh, tools, because they made it possible to have messages that are impossible to uh, impossible to decrypt. You could have sort of like perfect privacy. And what happens when these cryptographical knowledge algorithms get get to be known? connected with the whole whole thinking about uh, behind digital currencies and so on point which is the first first sort of uh, 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 like a self-launched money you don't have to have a central bank and you don't have to have commercial banks that usually or, or so far have had the monopoly in in uh, in launch, launching money so to these cryptographic algorithms and so on, these people get uh, the Bitcoin community gets the possibility to launch its own own money. So what is also happening now with alternative currencies and so on is that with the with the tools that we have, with the technological tools and the social organization that we have, we have the possibility of of creating these alternative monies or alternative alternative coins and. And, and so, the specific, specific instruments that, that we want to sort of, uh, in that sense, you could say that it's something like hacking money or hacking finance, that, that you make uh, new rules for how money operates or, or how finance operates. That's absolutely something that we fully agree with and that we will continue breaking the veil behind money and this whole um, idea that it cannot be changed or that we cannot really have power to issue currency and so forth because this is really the way to democratize as you were mentioning finance and money and so get the power back to ourselves in a way. Uh, we have a series of questions once again this is also to finish and wrap up the hangouts. Uh, so from Jason, uh, once again, he's saying, if Robin Hood, e.g. million members, what would happen? What would happen to financial markets if it reached that? Yeah, well, of course, there is that possibility because it's a parasite that mimics mimics uh, the other actors. So if it, if it would be, be, become really big, then it would start to following it, start, would start following its own tail. So it would become self-defeating. There is that possibility, but but uh, unfortunately, we are very far from that situation situation at the moment. We, we, okay. will worry uh, about, we will worry about that when we come to that. Yes, we will get to Jason on that. So thanks, Jason. Um, and Temu, once again, he's saying, is there any discussion about the possibility to start some kind of credit union 2.0 among the Robin Hood community? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The, the uh, uh, Temu and everybody else go to discourse.robinhoodcoop.com, which is our forums. And there we are, at, at the moment, we are thinking about these different possibilities of 
what we want to do with the, with the platform and what kind of applications we want to have there. And these, these uh, the ones that I have mentioned so far also are some of the ideas. But, but credit unions are one idea, options, uh, start, uh, doing equity crowdfunding in terms of options for, for different types of projects, artistic projects or startup businesses or, or whatever is another uh, other possibility. Venture communism, something, something like venture communism, communism is another possibility. So there will be, uh, basically we want to think about the, the uh, Robin Hood 2.0 or what we call Robin Hood Unlimited, the next, next stage. Where, where you have this platform on the blockchain and, and then you can make your own. We, we are going to provide some apps. We have some uh, ideas about that and we have already some wireframes and, and mockups that, that we want to test with the different communities on, on how they would use it and how, what they find uh, uh, helpful and what they would want to have there. Uh, but, but other people can also launch their own apps on the platform. That can uh, that can then uh, or that can, they can design to uh, do the kinds of financial transaction and financial relationships that they want to have. So it, in that sense, it would be like a universal platform for any type of uh, financial transaction. So that is then Robinhood becoming peer-to-peer -peer finance directly. Yes. Yes. And we hope to have the, the first first uh, uh, applications uh, that we can actually launch and, and show to people early next next spring. It would be great to also have an update once that this gets up and running to see how it goes working. And I'm very glad that it is also transitioning into this um, new endeavor. So great for that. Uh, we also have a couple of questions uh, from Jason. He's um, asking how would you describe the difference between Robin Hood and big banks, e.g. Scandinavian Nordea, with one or two sentences? I am about to get this thing, but still have to work a bit to understand the initiative. Uh, I think that the difference is this, that or, or we have been thinking about this kind of slogan, like there is this uh, slogan now for, for technology that there is no cloud, there are just other people's computers. If you put your files in the cloud, they are actually not in the cloud. They are on Google's computer or on Apple's computer, and they get to decide what they do with your information and what they what they sort of how they monetize it. So there is no cloud. There are just other people people's computers, and it's the same with banks. There are no banks. There are just other people's hedge funds. When you have money in the bank, it's actually a money that the that the uh, bank is using to play on the financial market. So what Robin Hood 1.0 already makes possible and what Robin Hood 2.0 is, is going to make even more possible is for you to decide what your money does when it is in the bank. So that is the difference. In, if you put money in the bank, it, it's in somebody else's hedge fund. But if you put money in, in Robin Hood, then it's, it, it is in your hedge fund. Oh, that's great. I, I mean, this is like really repurposing the way that currently the investment is taking place for all things that are mostly detrimental. Uh, can you briefly also explain the projects that have been recently funded? Yeah, they, there were three projects. Uh, the first one is called uh, Casa Nuvem in, in Rio, Jane, Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. They are, uh, uh, well, it's, they, are, they are a very multifaceted social center kind of, kind of thing. They do communal kits and they do artistic projects. They, they, park, they take part in demonstrations and, and so on. But it, it is a sort of very active social center there. The second one is uh, a project to get, uh, that the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation has together with the Catalan Integral Cooperative. Uh, they are planning uh, uh, the commons transition materials that Catalan in the, the Catalan Integral Cooperative uses in its own work. They are, they are doing translations and, and, uh, and uh, dissemination of that material. And the third is, is called Radio Schizo Analytic and the Steki. It's a project in, in uh, Northern Greece where there is a Canadi Canadian, uh, uh, how, how do they call it? Canadian low cost 
mining operator trying to open a uh, open pit uh, gold mine and they have been uh, they have been uh, uh, struggling against this uh, mine for for several years and this radio is part of trying to take uh, trying to take the monopoly on on the media away from the away from the uh, companies and, and commercial media so those those three projects okay we go to the last question um from jason if an individual from the poorest countries and conditions would be able to invest the minimum sum of membership 30 euros through crowdfunding provided by robin hood members could that cause developmental changes in the third country societies could that uh, what was the, could that what was the verb could that cost would that I didn't quite that cause developmental changes in third world countries if an individual uh, from a third world country could invest and suddenly maybe getting something crowdfunded or a funding project that's how I understand it to the yeah. third world country that he's from yeah of course of course and and uh, I think that the group in the group that were choosing the projects they were also trying to think about this kind of geographical balance in, in, in where the projects projects are they that was one of their criteria and we have also been thinking about this because of course still uh, 30 euros or 60 euros it is still a lot of money for many people so we have been thinking about campaigns of for instance uh, uh, donating shares by lottery or, or something like that so that we can can get the idea spread more more widely so that's that's one possibility that we could do but of course we are also we are also very aware that this is not a universal tool that solves all the problems mm -hmm. this is a, this is a, a learning project and and a process through which we learn about how the finance financial world works and in the in at the same time are able to repurpose some of those flows for building a world that is more hospitable to ourselves that has has more of these commons projects and hopefully especially through robin hood 2.0 we, we would sort of bootstrap that process into into making it possible for all kind of project economy and gift economy and that sort of thing to have the financial tools that they at the moment miss or that that the, uh, it, it is called financial services but the financial services that do not really serve people well they serve the one percent, but they don't serve the people. So that would be the the point to have final financial services for project economy, gift economy, startup economy, that kind of thing. Well, thank you very much for all of these clarifications and explanation because uh, this has definitely opened me a lot more of the perspective that I had only read from the information and other interviews and really on to the next step, which I very much agree with in the sense of getting that uh, power to the people in a more direct way. This peer-to-peer -peer finance really sounds interesting, alternative currencies, and also the fact that you are in your own way now planning to make the problem of inequality of being able to participate here also uh, some kind of an opportunity through this raffle uh, for people to participate. And that's the whole point, to make of this world something better with what is currently here, to then continue learning to potential uh, changes that can affect more and more people. That's where we stand for as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all. Thank you for all the good questions and comments from from the people there. Yes. Thanks to our viewers. Thanks also to Tepo Vesikuka because he was the one that enabled yeah, us to have you. this discussion <laughs> as well. And thanks to you, the viewer. Um, Jason is also uh, saying thank you. Uh, I will just read this question very quickly. What should happen if Robin Hood also started to lend money with a smaller leverage than big, big banks and through that also democratize the debt business? If you want to respond that in the YouTube uh, video, that could also be an option. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it there. And there are, there are actually people doing that already. So I'll, I'll put the links there. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching and we will see you guys next week and have a good time in Milan. See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.